All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another PNP Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff with Politics and Pros. Before we start today's event, I just want to go over a couple quick items. First, if anyone has a question for either one of our authors, we would ask for you to place it in the Q&A box, which you can find towards the bottom of your screen. Um, if you place it there, it will just help us facilitate the question and answer period, keep everything kind of organized. Separately, in the chat section, you'll be able to go throughout the event and you'll be able to find links which will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you'll be able to purchase copies of Don't Let It Get You Down by our featured author, as well as Aftershocks uh, written by our guest contributor here uh, for this event. Don't Let It Get You Down is a powerful and provocative collection of essays that offers poignant reflections on living between society's most charged, politicized, and intractably polar spaces between black and white, rich and poor, thin and fat. Savala Nolan is a writer, speaker, and a lawyer. She is executive director of the Thelton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. She and her writing have been featured in Vogue, Time, Harper's Magazine, New York Times Book Review, NPR, Forbes, Huffington Post, Health, Shape, and many more. She has also served as an advisor on the Peabody winning podcast, The Promise. Nolan will be joined in conversation by Nadia Ousu, a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. She is the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review chat book contest. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Granta, The Guardian, Bon Appetit, Electric Literature, The Paris Review Daily, and Catapult. Aftershocks is her first book. Without any further ado, Nadia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Prashan. So Bala, I'm so excited to finally get to meet you. We had a little bit of a chat before, but I'm really excited to dig into talking about your wonderful essay collection. Um, I remember hearing about it first from our shared editor, the lovely Dawn Davis, and she was sort of raving about your essays and I love her taste. So when she asked me um, or offered to send me an advanced copy, I was really excited about it. And then as soon as I received it, I was just drawn in by your voice, which is so open and searching and um, you so rigorously examine and reckon with so many difficult truths and never reach for a simple answer, always being willing to, to be kind of suspended in complexity and questions. Um, and I just, I loved these essays. Um, they made me think, I saw myself in them and people I knew. Um, and I encountered knowledge that I held, but didn't know that I held. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for writing this book, for sharing your life with us. Um, I have so many questions for you, but um, I'd love to start by hearing a little bit of the prose in your voice. Do you have a little reading for us? I do have a little reading for you. Um, funny you should ask. And Nadia, thank you so much. And Bashan, thank you so much for um, the introduction and the invitation to be part of this event at Politics and Prose. I lived in DC very briefly and I, I love the bookstore from my time in the city. And again, Nadia, everything you said about me and my book, I could very easily say about you and your book. So maybe we're sort of kindred, you know, spirits as writers in that way. And uh, yeah, I'm really thankful that you're here. So on to the reading. I am going to read a short section, like between three and four minutes um, from the first essay in the book. And the essay is called On Dating White Guys While Me. And it's about um, my former, underlying former, um, but very deep and profound and persistent desire to be chosen by a certain type of white man as a romantic partner, because um, I believed for a lot of my life that being chosen by that kind of white guy would um, lift me out of, you know, the injury and some of the despair of my otherness, 
which felt so relentless to me um, and difficult to bear. So the essay is, uh, is about that pursuit, I guess you could say. Um, the other thing I will unpack for you, because it's obvious if you were getting a bigger slice of the, you know, the essay or reading the whole thing, um, but maybe is less obvious in a super short reading, is that of course I talk about my body and, and bodies in general in this essay. And in particular, I talk about my feet. Um, and I do that because you know, I guess to some extent it's still true, but certainly for most of my life, I was really self-conscious about my feet and felt that I had to conceal them. They're big, they're not like cute little petite feet, which is what I always wanted. Um, and their bigness seemed to kind of reveal something about the bigness of my whole body and the blackness of my whole body um, that I did not want these guys I was pursuing to be aware of. So somewhat particular to me, I guess, this thing about my feet. Um, but I do think that it's, it's probably fairly common and universal for people to have some part of their body that they hide or um, are in the habit of concealing because they think that to reveal it would um, tell some truth about them that, that they don't want told. So here's the piece. Holt was a catch, and I thought maybe we were heading somewhere, but then I saw his feet and they were beautiful, unlike mine. Dating requires intimacy, bare feet side by side, maybe touching at the foot of a bed in the sand, the grass. I did not want to place my feet next to his. His feet were smooth and well-shaped as if carved from marble with neat cuticles and nails filed symmetrically. When I saw them, I thought, they're like David's right foot. Years before, I'd sketched David's feet in charcoal, full of hope, the filtered light as gentle as a powder puff in the Florentine Museum, a hushed flow of tourists and art students around me. I wish I'd sketched the slaves in their pocked granite confines instead. But back then, in the spring of 2002, it was David who spoke to me. He was being cleaned with water and Q-tips by erudite Italians kneeling on scaffolding beside his pensive brow. That's how Holt's feet seemed to me, like things another person would carefully clean for him. There were many things about Holt that I liked. I liked how his biceps emerged from t-shirt sleeves. I liked how he stood next to me at that Christmas party on Benvenue Ave, brushed up and emitting a gently possessive warmth that made me giddy. I liked getting breakfast with him early in the morning at the coffee shop that served so-so coffee. And I liked how it looked to anyone walking by, me with him. I liked how he lingered when I drove him home that brisk autumn night leaning back into the car, suggesting we get together soon to study. We were in law school. His big nosed face and impish smile illuminated by porch light. I liked that he was from New York, that he was smart, that his dad was an iffy pres presence in his life like mine, that his sneakers were always clean, that he drank gobs of whiskey and beer and never seemed drunk that his East Coast self-possession shone brightly against the floppy California exuberance in which we lived. And I liked that he was white. I liked his whiteness in an uncomfortable subterranean way. I'd long sensed that the most succinct, irrefutable way to move up in the world was to be loved by a prototypical white man, i.e. someone at the top. There's a cultural magic in their approval, a kind of magnetizing glitter that surrounds the approved of object. So I pursued them. I had relationships with men of color too, but a certain type of white guy had a particular hold on my psyche. I hoped in landing one to earn a medal, to sling it around my neck and prove that I wasn't too low on the ladder for blessings adjacent to them, accepted by them, I'd undo the injuries of not belonging I'd endured. 
I'd become the girl I'd ached and tried my whole childhood and adolescence to be. A version of that fairy-like Nordic blonde in a Timothée shampoo commercial over whom I obsessed as a child, floating on my back in the bath and imagining my brown cotton candy hair with a white silk ribbon like hers. Holt had potential. He could be my world of oysters. We clicked. He seemed to see that I was bright, credentialed, special. He, with his jocular, confident whiteness, could slay my otherness, rescue me from the ogre of myself. I'd grieve, yes, but then I'd watch my life bloom, unfettered by bigness, by brownness. I really believed this until I saw his feet, which were so handsome, sophisticated even, compared to mine. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful to hear in your voice. Oh, thank you, Nadia. Yeah. Um, so I have so many questions. And also for the audience, um, please put your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them um, soon. Um, but first, I wanted to ask a little bit about your uh, the origin story of the book. Um, when you started writing the essays, what you were searching for and trying to work out within them, what questions you were carrying, just sort of how, how the book came to be. I think when I was writing these essays, even before I had any notion that they were going to become a book, um, before that even seemed possible, like before I had an agent, you know, like when it was really just me writing uh, in my room by myself, um, I was still trying to answer some pretty heavy questions. I was still trying to contend with um, the ways that I'm dislocated in the culture. You know, I have this kind of resume of polarities within me. I have a lot of in-betweenness and a lot of both and, um, or you could say neither nor, you know, depending on your mood within me, you know, being black and also white, um, being Mexican, but not speaking Spanish, having been both fat and thin, you know, more than once throughout my whole life. And as a woman in particular, you know, we're so, um, tied to how we look. And so having kind of the right kind of body and the wrong kind of body through my childhood and adolescence and adulthood um, has created kind of like, you know, a sense of double consciousness, but also dislocation, right? Around, around womanhood. I have some of that with class. Like I'm not from money and there are pockets of really brutal poverty in my family. Um, that I spent time in, but I have moved in some very wealthy and elite spaces, like private schools, you know, nannying for the uber rich, working briefly at the White House, the Obama White House, just to be crystal <laughs> clear, not any of the other White Houses that might be coming up in people's minds. Um, so I am always, as a writer, thinking about um, how we are positioned in the culture and what our position means for how we relate to each other. And I was asking, you know, what my position was, right? Trying to kind of make a map of the culture and, and plot myself and my life on it. Um, and when I was writing just for myself, you know, of course that process is somewhat selfish, you know, it's like I'm making my own map. Um, but as I, got closer to the process of, of, you know, realizing it was going to be a book um, and that you can't just write a book for yourself, you know, uh, it became increasingly important that the map I was making be useful to like other people, you know, to my fellow travelers, that other people pick it up and be able to kind of use it as a mirror. Um, in which they saw themselves reflected in the culture or use it like as a window or a doorway um, through which they could see something that maybe they hadn't seen before. I hope that kind of answers your question. It definitely does. And okay. as someone who also occupies many of those in-between spaces, I definitely, you know, as I said, saw myself reflected in these essays and was very grateful for this map, as you say. Um, I'm also curious about the title um, in terms of that origin story, Don't Let It Get You Down. Where did, where did that title come from? 
Okay. Thank you for asking Nadia, because I love, I love talking about this. Um, the title is something that was said to me by an older black person, um, my hairdresser who I've known for a very long time. And he said it to me when I was at the salon getting my hair done about, I guess it would have been five or six years ago. So here's, here's the story. I was sitting in the chair, you know, just at the salon, right. Just hanging out. Um, perusing the app for news on my phone and, you know, went from having this pretty cool low key day to, uh, being very shaken by the headline, um, that said that the, the cops who murdered Tamir Rice were not going to be prosecuted. And, you know, for those who don't remember, Tamir Rice was a little boy, um, in the Midwest who was playing in a park and uh, somebody called 911 and said, it looks like he has a gun. It looks like a toy, but I'm scared, you know? And then this sort of salient thing, I think the things that, that most people remember is that the cops pulled up and it was two seconds before they fired um, and killed him. So, you know, heartbreaking for all the reasons um, that everyone in this room knows already. And then seeing that, that, that they were not gonna prosecute the, the men who, who killed Tamir Rice. Um, I was really taken aback, you know, I kind of blanched a little bit and my hairdresser who's known me for so long said, you know, what's wrong, what's going on? And I explained and he paused. Um, and the, the first thing he said to me after I, you know, said basically everything I'm saying to you, he said, don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you down. He said it twice and he said it with none of kind of the bright like peppiness or like sassiness that we, you know, don't let it get you down, girl. Like there was none of that. It was very weary. It was like a warning. Um, and I realized in that moment and, you know, as I reflected on it afterward, realized even more deeply that that a black person who's older than me, like seen more than me, was offering me a survival strategy in that moment. Um, a survival strategy with very high stakes, like which accounts for, I think, the weariness and the way that he said it and the firmness and the way that he said it. Um, you know, if you're black, you could take your pick of groups that have been marginalized, you know, socially, politically, legally, but if you're black, and you let it get you down, like you you allow yourself to dwell in the shadow side of our history and our present moment. Um, like you may never get up, right? You may you may drown. So he was alerting me to the reality that you have to find a way to stay afloat despite the history and the present moment. And the stakes are very high because your survival and your wellness is tied to that. So that's the way that I mean it and kind of a high stakes, um, cautionary survival strategy way, particularly to my fellow travelers who are part of the communities that are more marginalized in our culture. Um, but there's another way that I almost could have put a question mark at the end, um, of that phrase, because if I'm talking to people who hold a lot of privilege or power, or if I'm talking to those aspects of myself, it's kind of like, well, maybe you actually should let it get you down. <laughs> like, maybe you really should dwell in the sadness of how we allocate safety and concern in this world and um, observe your position in the hierarchy and let it bring you to your knees, you know, because it isn't right and it isn't fair. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean it in a complex way. And I hope that in the book, it operates on both levels. Mm -hmm. There was a moment when, you know, there were lots of different titles on the table. And I think Dawn, our shared editor and my agent, liked don't let it get you down you know they were like all excited about it and um I was a little nervous because I thought it's gonna end up on like a self-help you know the self-help shelf like next to the Tony Robbins um which would have been fine Tony Robbins is great not knocking him but you know I I was worried about that but I have come to understand um 
just how well it captures the complexity of the book itself. So that's where the title comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I mean, that was just such a, a powerful answer. And um, I think it really illustrates a lot of the complexity and the different meanings that anything can take depending on sort of your, uh, who you are in the world and like where your body is in the world and what privileges they're afforded. And and so that, that, that makes so much sense to me that it's sort of, um, can mean different things to different people or even to yourself at different times, depending on sort of how you're understanding your relationship to power and privilege and all of those things, yeah. which I think leads me to another question, which you sort of touched on already, but it's about sort of the double consciousness or this awareness, in your case, multiple consci consciousness, really, um, that we can think of, you know, um, as a sense that that black Americans in particular, but people who, you know, come from marginalized communities too, have of always looking at ourselves through the eyes of others and specifically white people and measuring, you know, our souls by the tape of the world, of, of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity, as Du Bois put it. Mm. Um, but in your case, you're also wrestling with how this connects to your multiracial and ethnic heritage, multi-ethnic heritage. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about that, um, kind of open that up a little more and about how you experienced the white gaze um, and how you sought to bring your particular experience um, to the page. Nadia, you are a good question writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is a great question. I mean, I think I think everybody probably knows what you mean when you say white gaze, but if there's confusion, sometimes I will compare it to the male gaze, which I think maybe has a slightly bigger footprint in the culture, you know? So just as, uh, you know, women, and I use that word very inclusively, we learn to see ourselves through the eyes of men, through the male gaze, um, sort of objects of male desire or whatever you know, people of color learn to see themselves through the white gaze and the way that that creates an objectification. Um, so yeah, I mean, the white gaze is on me, right? Like it's on all of us because it's the water, um, but it's also in me, which I find fascinating and disturbing <laughs> and worthy of investigation and disruption. Um, it's in me, you know, I think for a lot of reasons, like I was raised in a largely white family. My white mother was my primary caregiver. Um, so in addition to just being in the culture, you know, and having the white gaze kind of put into me through movies and film and television and, and books and all that stuff, um, you know, I had it in my family too. So it's on me and I've internalized it. And, and because it's also inside me, unfortunately I use it, right? Like in the book, I, I write about um, both sides of that. I write about being kind of in the cold spotlight of the white gaze, which is never going to look at my body um, lovingly, right? I'm not talking about individual white people, to be clear. I'm talking about the cultural phenomenon of whiteness and, the gaze that is attached to it. Um, I write about that, but I also try to interrogate the ways that I behold the world um, with an internalized white gaze. And, you know, it comes up in like almost every essay, which is kind of sad. I mean, certainly in the one that I read from at the top of our time together. Um, but also, you know, another, another essay where it really, really troubled me was one where I'm writing about some family history. And the family history in question involves um, being descended from enslaved people on my father's side, which is the Black and Mexican side, and learning that I am also descended from people who enslaved, right, from human traffickers on my mom's side, which is the white side of the family. And there's a lot going on in that essay, but one of the things I think that's like, you know, um, responsive to your question, Nadia, is my attempt to imagine the people that we enslaved and trafficked, right? We know some of their names from a deed from my fourth great grandfather, um, Phyllis, Grace, and Peggy are three of their names. 
And I had and have this very intense craving to see them and understand them and humanize them um, like for the historical record, you know, but also just internally for my own heart and my own sense of who I am as a person who inherited my family's history. Um, but I worry in the piece that there's no way for me to see those three women who were trafficked by my family against their will um, without seeing them through whiteness, right? Cause that's the water. So there are people like Toni Morrison who managed to somehow elude the white gaze in their writing, right? Like she's kind of the original and everlasting master of that. Um, I'm like nowhere near that, you know, I'm not, I don't even, I regret even saying her name because it like, <laughs> sounds like I'm drawing a comparison. So forget I said that. Let me just say um, that what I am doing in this book is trying to interrogate the white gaze as it functions within me and as a barrier between me and myself and me and other black and brown people. Um, and also like tend the wounds that I've accrued from being under the white gaze, which can be, you know, quite searing, as I'm sure you know. Thank you for that. Um, I also, uh, kind of relatedly, I mean, because you 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 also brought up um, the male gaze, um, and a lot of this book, you're writing about bodies. You're writing about your body, black women's bodies, black bodies, white bodies, the stories that are told about bodies and the value placed upon them. Um, and um, in the essay on dating white guys, you wrestle with your own desire for your body to be seen as beautiful and desirable, as we heard in the reading, particularly by white men and largely because of the power and social capital that, that it would bring. And you write, um, I'd long sensed that the most succinct, irrefutable way to move up in the world was to be loved by a prototypical white man. And you write also, about being haunted by the mammy stereotype and about trying to starve yourself into something more closely resembling a thin white body. And this writing is so vulnerable, but it's also really embodied. You're writing from inside of your body um, in so many ways and, and, and really clear eyed, you know, as you said, you're sort of wrestling with and reckoning with um, what you have internalized, sort of what you've drunk from the poisoned groundwater um, to kind of expand that metaphor. And so um, I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit more about what you hope that readers take away from these stories and and also maybe what you learned about your own body um, and how you see it, you know, having come out on the other side of this reckoning, although it's ongoing work, I'm sure it's yeah. like long work, but, but you know. I'm having, scared. Yeah. <laughs> having done some of that work, you know, how you, how how you think about seeing and loving your body now through that process. Mm. Yeah, it's ongoing, 100%, like every day, ongoing work. Um, especially because I think I write about this in the book. I've written about it other places. I started dieting at such a young age, um, like three or four. And, you know, that obviously was not my decision. Like I was enrolled in that process before I could voluntarily consent to it. Um, and that the dieting, you know, I think stemmed mostly out of the white gaze and how it beheld my chubby brown body um, and how, how it problematized my body as a child. So um, on go this, you know, I mentioned that just to say, yes, it's an ongoing process because it's been with me for so long, you know, it's like part of my life's work, you know, um, I hope that for, I hope that for people whose bodies, um, feel objectified, violated, used, you know, um, not worthy of, boundaries, you know, who, whose bodies are mistreated by the culture in any number of ways. I hope that um, the book functions as like a mirror and a hug, which is not my phrase, it's a phrase from somebody else, um, and gives them a sense of, you know, their inherent okayness, you know, like just gives them um, something that feels good right? Because it's hard to feel good when you live in a body that's fundamentally targeted or disliked by the culture. 
for people that have um, bodies that are kind of more safe, more desirable, more, um, you know, regarded with more tenderness by the culture, you know, I hope that they maybe see that even more deeply, like through reading these 12 essays about embodiment. And um, I hope that they also, I hope that they also come away with like a deeper awareness of the politics of their own body. I think when you're in one of the bodies that society kind of kicks around, like you get that it's political, you know, you, you have to, it's obvious. Um, but when you're in a body that's really safe and protected and kind of beloved, you don't, you don't have to consider how political that is, right? It just kind of feels like what's natural, what's normal. You don't even have to think about it. That's the nature of privilege, right? Privilege says, if it's not a problem for me, it's not a problem. So I hope that people basically come away with a, with a stronger connection to their own body and a stronger sense of how the personal and the political and the historical are in constant collision in their bodies, right? Our bodies are like the site of that constant impact because our bodies are where we experience race and gender and all of these things that we make such a big deal out of and that are a big deal. Um, you know, as far as what I learned about my own body, I'll say what I learned about my own body before I started writing, because I think that's maybe the better, more interesting answer. I could not have written this book while I was still dieting, um, because dieting for me was a fundamentally anti-Black process, project, right? It was about, as you so beautifully said, trying to meet a white normative beauty ideal, right? So it's inherently anti-Black. Um, and it was like inherently anti-body. Like I was literally trying to um, make my body go away. <laughs> you know, like that's the whole point of a diet. Um, and we could have like a whole other conversation because I'm super political about this, but I'll stay in the lane of the book. I just want to say that, you know, if I had been still in that project of dieting and controlling my body and wanting it to go away and not liking it and seeking outside approval and all of that, um, I wouldn't have wanted to engage with my body. I wouldn't have wanted to live in it consciously. And I had to do that to write this book because my body is like in the center of it. Um, so learning that I didn't have to diet and that my ancestral blueprint is fine, better than fine. Learning that I could love my body or even better, just feel neutral about it. Like, you know, body love is great, but it's far better to just kind of not care. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm worthy no matter how I feel about my body on a given day. Um, learning that it was fine to be fat, learning that I am fat. Um, naturally, not because something is wrong, but that's just naturally what my body is. Learning all of those things freed me up to write the book. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Good. Um, I, I actually want to pull from a question from the audience because it's related hmm. um, to what we were just talking about and also just remind people to put questions <laughs> in the Q&A. But um, Erica is asking, or First, she's sharing that the white gaze extends to work too. Um, she says, I have this- the work, 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 professional, okay. Yeah, the workplace. Um, I have that she, this is what Erica is saying. I have this issue which makes it harder at work if you are browner and heavier than white people as a woman of color, even if you have a master's and PhD. And she's wondering if you have also had this experience. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I, what I think is that my fatness and my blackness potentiate each other. Like they reinforce each other. They both operate in um, lanes that sort of the dominant culture sees as pathological, as not ideal, as to be feared and avoided. Um, a lot of the stereotypes that we attach to blackness we attach to fatness, 
laziness, like inherently unhealthy or off or different, um, gluttonous, out of control, you know? So for me, it's like, I don't know. I certainly have light skin privilege. There's no question about that. And I'm, I'm well aware of it, especially when I'm driving past a cop and I I'm realizing that they're just seeing a flash of like pink, you know, as I'm driving by. Um, but there is another way in which being fat makes me blacker and being black makes me fatter. And I feel that all the time at work, um, partly because of who I work with, right? They're progressive, lovely people by and large, and I'm incredibly lucky to, to have them as colleagues, but they tend to be white and they tend to be thin because um, I work in kind of an elite elitist space. You know, I work at a law school. Um, and so I feel that all the time. I feel it all the time. And I wish I could offer, you know, the one, two, three cure, but I can offer validation, you know, and a sense of solidarity. And also kind of the footnote that like, part of the problem with being marginalized, part of what makes it exhausting is that, you know, whether or not like in that exact moment um, there's degradation happening, like almost doesn't matter because you're aware that it might be happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're aware that if you brought it up, people would probably look at you like, huh? You know, so you're carrying it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really exhausting. You know, I, I don't have an answer for you. I just have like fellowship and and I totally get it. And uh, there have been times that I have like taken, used paid time off to just not have to go to work because I just need to be black and fat and female and not um, feel looked at like there's something other or weird about it. So if you have that opportunity or that option, you know, avail yourself of it. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to um, kind of shift gears a little bit, and I wanted to ask you a question that memoirists and essayists, um, people who are writing about the real lives and real people often get asked, um, but I think it's an important question. Um, and I was sort of reflecting on my experience of reading uh, your essays and um, just kind of the ways in which you write with a great deal of care and love for so many of the people in your life who show up in this book. And that doesn't mean sort of um, hiding, hiding the difficult parts or kind of sweeping anything under the rug, but it does mean that you, um, you put a lot of complexity on the page and like allow people kind of the fullness of their humanity. And, and I was particularly moved by how you wrote about your father. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, were there any principles that you held in terms of how to write about real people? And, you know, what were some of the questions you wrestled with related to this and some of the challenges? Yeah, this is definitely a memoirist question. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, everyone, everyone in my family has their real name, but every, any, everyone who's not in my family like has a fake name and certain little details are shifted um, so that their anonymity is preserved. You know, I, there were people who I did not want to feel like I needed their permission to write about my experience with them. Um, and so creating a little bit of anonymity that way was, was certainly helpful. But um, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. Like one, I had to just be very focused on the truth as I understood it, you know, and aware that other people are going to have a different memory of certain things or interpret things differently, um, but be as solid and like as crystal clear, as close to the bone as I possibly could be in terms of what I remembered for myself to be true. And then like, you know, noting where there was like, like there are a couple places in the book where I happen to know the person I'm talking about remembers it differently. And so I say that, you know, mm -hmm. um, somebody told me early on that, you know, when you're writing about other people, particularly in a way that might be challenging or upsetting, you know, to them, you have to really think about your motivation. Um, I didn't want to grind axes, 
I didn't want to make people look bad. I didn't want to oversimplify anybody. Um, so I really questioned my motivation, especially when I was sort of writing something that was critiquing someone else's behavior. Um, and there were things that like were in the first draft that were not in the final draft because I came to understand that like, oh, there's an ax grind happening right here. You know, as far as my parents go, my mom raised me like, you know, everlasting praise to the single moms of the world. Um, and she also, you know, she's white and she also had the presence of mind to understand that um, she had to provide me some education about race and my own blackness that would have probably happened automatically had my black father stayed in the home, but he didn't. So it wasn't automatic. So she stepped out of herself to do that um, imperfectly as I write about in the book, but still she did it. And um, I never want to, you know, flatten her into like the villain who made me diet my whole life, you know, because it's complex. And with my dad, I think I felt that even more strongly, you know, this is a black man who was incarcerated and uh, before I was born and who was not especially present in my life when I was younger and um, who had passed away by the time I was writing the book. And I was determined not to flatten him into a stereotype of blackness and black maleness that we are all primed to see, right? We're all primed to kind of see like the, a few little points of someone's identity and be like, okay, yeah, another black guy who was incarcerated and like didn't raise his kid. Um, I could not let that happen to him. So I was very conscious of also trying to not in a way that was like glorifying, you know, unnecessarily, but throw a little bit of glory on my parents um, for different reasons. For my mom, because she raised me and she raised me well. And for my dad, because he's a black man and he was flattened enough in his lifetime. Um, and that couldn't be the legacy of him from the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you did it beautifully. Those stories oh, thank are really you. tender and really complex and um, yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, the essay White Doll. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, that essay kind of stood out to me because I had been thinking about some of the issues that it grapples with, um, given sort of the data that has been proliferating around the kind of horrifying and shameful black maternal health crisis in this country. Um, and, you know, I have people who I love who have similar experiences to the ones that you recounted in this essay. You know, we know that black mothers are nearly three times as likely to die as a result of childbirth than white mothers, for example. And, and you across write, class, I mean, yeah. just to interrupt, across class, so like mm -hmm. poor black mothers, rich black mothers, doesn't matter. But yeah. No, that's, that was such an important point. Um, and you write, um, I want credit for surviving a racialized pregnancy. Um, and I thought that that was just such a powerful statement. And I kind of sat with it for a while because yes, you should get credit for that. And it's, it's just completely unacceptable. Um, and so I was wondering if you might, if you might talk a little bit about writing that essay about why it felt so important to you to tell that story. Um, and also maybe, you know, for those who haven't read the book, some of the things you learned from your experience of giving birth to your daughter um, and what needs to change. Man, I mean, this was one of the harder essays to write because it involved a profoundly traumatic experience and traumatic, you know, at an inflection point in my life, like becoming a mother and giving birth and being pregnant. That's an inflection point for anyone who does it. So it's already a very fraught um, moment. And then on top of it, it was very, very traumatic. I won't dwell on the details because I want you to buy the book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> because we're short on time, but long story short, I had um, a slew of symptoms throughout my pregnancy and after my daughter was born that were strange and awful and, and totally dismissed by my white doctors, even though they put me in the emergency room several times. Um, and ultimately I ended up having urgent surgery and I delivered my daughter on the cardiac ICU and, you know, to boot the symptoms that I was having were textbook symptoms for two different medical problems 
neither of which was tested for um, or investigated, you know, so it was just, it was, a, it was yet another instance of not being taken seriously, um, being sort of belittled and like almost like made fun of at times by, by medical um, staff and doctors when I talked about what I was experiencing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, it, I knew it was racialized, you know, I knew it the way that you have to have a sense about, um, let me say it differently. I knew it was racialized because my instinctual knowledge told me that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I don't discount that instinctual knowledge because, you know, it's the same way that like prey has to understand when a predator is close. Like, Mm -hmm it's a survival thing to develop an instinct about when you are in danger. Um, And so that's why I trust that knowledge of when I think something is racialized. And then the statistics really kind of brought it home and it was like, oh, okay, this probably seriously 100% was racialized. Um, The other statistics that did that were, you know, around doctors not thinking that black people feel pain or Mm -hmm. not thinking that they feel pain the way white people do. so I wanted to, I had to write about it for myself to process the trauma, but I wanted to write about it in a way that would mean something to other people, you know, not just be kind of my own diary entry because it's true. Like I, <laughs> I survived a racialized experience um, that could have killed me, that did harm me and um, is still with me. You know, the harm is ongoing. And I didn't get any credit for it, you know? Um, And that's a problem. (laughs) I wanted to claim my right to say that and uh, to declare the truth of what happened and then to be embraced and healed and recognized and not have the reality slid out of you because it's inconvenient or because I don't have the right kind of data to back it up. You know, I don't have the email calling me an N word from the ob you know, I don't have that type of stuff. I just have my instinct and what I know. Um, I wanted to own that space for myself and for other people. So that's, you know, that's why I wrote about it. And um, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the answer is like no more white supremacy. Right? <laughs> um, but I will say I'm not comparing my experience to that of people who were enslaved by any means. That's not an accurate comparison. Um, but I say what I'm about to say simply to point out that, um, you know, history in the present moment are real blurry and they're blurry in our bodies. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a very long tradition of mistreating black people in medicine and of disrupting and disregarding black women's reproductive health and their rights. Like it was essential to chattel slavery continuing. Um, So, you know, it's like a, it's a, it's a thread in that fabric. I'm not saying it's the same thread, but it's part of a larger history. And I wanted to draw attention to that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that essay, I feel like is such an important essay. And I think everyone should definitely read it. So buy the book to read that essay. Um, Yeah, and I think the point that you're making is so important, too, in terms of thinking about how the how history is alive and present and how, you know, part of the kind of questioning of those instincts that are so important because they keep us alive, right? Those instincts that kicked in that told you that this was a racialized experience. Part of the um, refusal to believe those instincts or, or the pretense that those yeah. instincts are not are not real is in order to um, to put the past in the past and let's move, you know, and to, and to not, Uh, continue to address the ways in which the past is present and is ongoing. And, um, and so I wanted to talk about that a little bit too, kind of related to class and its intersections with race and, um, and its slipperiness. Um, And so I, 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 because race and class in this country are so inextricably linked. And so often we hear these um, kind of uh, 
arguments every few years, like races, it's not race anymore, it's class, <laughs> as though those things can be separated in a country that's sort of built on genocide and slavery. Yeah. Um, but so I wanted to talk a little bit about that because class is so discussed in your book, as you kind of alluded to um, in the beginning of this conversation. And so um, I w was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think Americans are still getting wrong about how we understand and talk <laughs> about class. Well, um, I'm not going to put my professor hat on because I'm not a professor of sociology or, you know, economics or something. I'd love to hear what, what someone like that has to say about this. But based on my own experience, I mean, I am someone who, you know, as I've said, in my family, there are pockets of poverty. I grew up not in abject poverty. You know, I grew up in my mom's house, was, which was pretty stable, but by no means like had no money, you know, like the furniture came from Goodwill, you know, the shoes came from Payless. Um, so, but I am now like a lawyer, you know, I live in a pretty nice house. Like I've sort of moved up the class ladder um, in many ways. I don't know if I've done it in a durable way, right? Like there's a lot of precarity when you don't come from wealth. So you might very easily fall down the class ladder. Um, but I think that like, you know, to answer your question a little more tightly, I think, uh, people don't necessarily understand just how little moving up the class ladder, uh, can do as far as protecting you from the bullshit that might come at you if you're in a marginalized body, like, Yes, not having money makes everything worse. Having money makes a lot of things better. But um, if your body is fundamentally targeted, you know, because you're trans, because you're fat, because you're trans and fat, you know, whatever the constellation of things is, um, having money can't really protect you. It can't protect you from the biases of other people. It can't protect you from the violence of, you know, the systems that we live under. And so one of the things that I have come to realize is that, you know, the, there is value in pursuing wealth as long as we live in capitalism, you know, I, I can't deny that, but uh, it's kind of like Lily, I think if Lily Thompson said the problem with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat, right? And there's a way that like, I don't know, I could be as rich as Rockefeller. I'm still fat, black and female. I'm still going to have to contend with um, all that that means in our society. I wouldn't change any of those aspects of who I am for the record. You know, I would not trade who I am or any part of who I am to be more normatively legible and acceptable in the culture um, because how grotesque, right? I, I just, it's unthinkable, but I still am positioned in a way where my body is fundamentally a target and that is inescapable, no matter what kind of, you know, house I live in or car I drive. And uh, maybe that's depressing. Maybe it's a little bit freeing, right? Maybe it's an argument for socialism. I don't know, that's a whole other book talk. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. <laughs> So we do have a question from the audience, so maybe I'll get that in um, and then we might have uh, time for one more. So if, if anyone has another question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, but someone in the audience would like to know, um, speaking of you being a lawyer, um, that it's cool to see a lawyer with a writing career and um, they're wondering if you feel like there's any overlap between your essays and your legal and teaching career. Oh yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. I, so in my lawyer mode, I run the social justice program at a public law school located in Berkeley, California. So very progressive um, space professionally. And I get to spend all day thinking about power and privilege and subordination and, you know, how what we think about bodies creates law and then how law influences what we think about bodies, right? Like they co-create each other over time. Um, and, and you know, I, I write about those same things, you know, I, less about the law, but I write about the same questions of power and privilege and belonging and harm and restoration, you know, 
um, and value fundamentally. It's like a question of what and who we value. Um, that's really what the law is, right? It's determinations about what and who we value. And uh, I think about that as a writer too. Um, you know, I guess the other thing I'll say is just, if this is someone who's thinking about going to law school, <laughs> like when I decided to go to law school, I, I was very happy to do it. I was fresh off the Obama campaign and just filled with energy. But I sort of thought I was, I was also giving up um, being a writer. Um, and that wasn't true. So if you're someone who's interested in law and also interested in writing, you know, you don't, you don't have to choose. That's a great question and a great answer. Um, so, uh, maybe I'll give you kind of, we have a few minutes left, so maybe I'll give you a couple of options for last questions and you can pick which one you want to answer. Okay. Um, so the first one is, um, what is the most important thing you hope readers take away from this book? I, I feel like you've covered a lot, um, but if there's something in particular um, that you're hoping that, that we pay attention to as we read these wonderful essays, or um, another question is, uh, if you're thinking about a next project and, um, you know, it's really hard to answer sort of what is, what is it about, but maybe if there yeah. are questions still animating um, your writing, um, would love to hear about that. Yeah, I can answer both actually. Um, I feel like I've kind of answered, you know, what do I hope people take away in the like political sense, you know? But the other thing I hope people take away is just the pleasure of beautiful writing, you know, like everything ain't for everybody. So you don't have to think my writing is beautiful, but um, I hope that people find the work to be literary and sensory and sensual and um, pleasing, right? Just pleasing to the ear, pleasing to the eye. That matters a lot to me as a writer. Um, and as far as my next project, so I'm really interested in publishing short fiction. And um, my agent has told me that that's like close to impossible, but I have a spreadsheet and a dream. And so I'm pursuing it. I mean, Nadia, you may know this. I guess if you want to write a book of short stories, you also have to write a novel. Like they go together <laughs> in the book contract. That right? is the rumor. That is where that's the rumor. rumor. So yeah. that's why he was like, mm, you know, unless you're going to write a novel, you're not going to you're not getting a book deal for short stories. But um, we'll see who's right. And you know, I'm still writing very much about motherhood and about my body as a mother, for better and worse, and what that means. Whether it will be a book, I don't know, but. Um, that's kind of what I'm doing in my free time with my writing. That's wonderful. That's so exciting. I hope that your agent is wrong <laughs> and that there is a collection of short stories to come. I and hope also so. a novel, potentially. Yeah, you mean it's possible. You never <laughs> you did it. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much. This has been such a joy um, to be in conversation with you. And really, everyone, please buy this book. It's a wonderful collection. It's really thought provoking. And um, to speak to your hope for the book, um, it was uh, just on the craft level, really beautiful. Um, your mm -hmm. way with language was, is wonderful. And um, yeah, I, I really encourage everyone to, to read this. Um, and I wanna thank Politics and Prose too for hosting us and having us. Um, but yeah, this has, been, this has been really lovely. And thank you to everyone for joining. It has been so lovely. And I wanna encourage everyone to buy Nadia's memoir because it too, like if, if you kind of like my book, you're gonna, flip and love her book. Um, so yeah, buy two books or go to the library and check <laughs> two books out if that's how you roll. That's good too. Thank you so much for the chance to talk with you, Nadia, and to talk at the audience. <laughs> we're a person, but we're not. Um, and thank you, Politics and Prose, for supporting this little book. And um, my cup runneth over. I'm very thankful. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.